We Okay, we are nearing our startup time. Um, we may or may not be able to show the and all the stuff that SizeTrack had worked out because he's on a screen sharing with me and we haven't tested this before to find out uh, whether or not it's going to work. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, we're all effing fools. Uh, we got it to work. We got it to work. Yep, so I'm looking at it right now on your channel. Oh, off you my go. microphone over here. Yeah, see, I'm seeing this, the, the classroom up on the, uh, the, the, the further feed. Absolutely. Kind it's of looking, maybe? Fully functional. Let's just play your intro. Okay, yay! Next time, I'll, next time we'll add your music to it. This was just to see if it would work. Here we go. Yeah. Everybody just imagine. See how symphonic I can sound? That's, that was really cool. <laughs> the very young fella. All right, well. Oh, my busy. Now Damn it all. Yeah, now just, how is everybody tonight? Okay. Now let me stop screen sharing. Yeah, there. okie doke. There you go. Now, uh... You get to see my point. Uh, Fino actually has a question right off the bat. Um, what's your opinion about the news that the city of Williamstown wants to change the tax code? By the way, RJ, click so back on... Non Click back on you. Everybody's just looking at the pug. Oh, Which, dear. Okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah. pugs, Well, I, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> the pug is awfully cute. Pugs do rock, but I think people come here to see you, Chief. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you anyway, go. about the uh, nonprofits have to pay the admission tax. Yeah. Uh, Fino is bringing up that charming example of uh, Ken Ham's attempt to do a Kent Hovind tax trick. Uh, to wriggle around paying like his fair share as this local area had discovered that the the great font of tourism from the Ark Park wasn't really doing all that well and so they were going to uh, try to make them actually pay a bit more of their fair share and I, I haven't been following all of the, the ins and outs of all the legal cases on that. I'm wishing them all the worst luck <laughs> uh, and we'll see whether or not that works out. Oh, didn't they say they had to pay back? Uh, Cornlips brings up 18 million in tax breaks. Yeah, um, they're, they're contesting it. The, the local community is wanting to apply this tax to the Ark Park, and uh, the Ark Park is saying, yet, yet. And so they did a little trick where they sold it for $10 to a subdivision of themselves so that they would no longer be justified. Uh, they wouldn't be under the jurisdiction. And the city is going, ah, pulling fast ones here which shows that when push comes to shove, it can be just as slippery like an eel as uh, Wackaloon Kent Hovind. Whoa. Anyway, uh, we'll find out how that works out. That's an ongoing lawsuit. And, and I guess the state, according to the, the coverage that um, was on uh, Meta's um, uh, thing on, um, yipes, uh, a friendly atheist, uh, because he's been covering this a little bit, was saying that the city is a fear that if they can get away with it, they're going to find other little tricky things to get away from having to pay their supplies. And so the city is basically stopped for cash, uh, and uh, they're wanting to maneuver around it. What good is this great big white elephant of a boat sitting over there? It could be just as uh, implausible and uh, problematic a circumstance as all the other previous of Arcs to bear. Hi, everybody. So, uh, I did put up also a linkage um, uh, at various spots for people who want to dive into the live feed here. I'm okay for that. Uh, if anybody um, feels like jumping in on that in case they want to say, people get to see this damn mug too much. Uh, I agree completely. I am not the most attractive person on earth. This is, not, this, is not, this is not Tom Cruise territory, although I think I have a better brain than Tom Cruise. Uh, would have a better brain than Tom Cruise. Well, that's another matter. Anyway. Be able to arc, uh, in my, I, I, it was funny because I was uh, doing some uh, research on uh, some uh, creationist archaeology uh, over the last couple of days and how only a few years ago they had a box-shaped arc in the imagery. So this new super tanker design that you see uh, in the uh, arc encounter is kind of a new revisionism 
Uh, it looks right pretty, though. It's got that nice little bulge down below where I think the sonar dome went for Noah. And uh, <laughs> we have, yeah, you didn't know they had all of that technology stuff, you know. They had fluorescent lighting. It was just amazing what they were able to do back in the uh, uh, second millennium BC uh, or third millennium. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't coin, uh, coin lips. It says, I'm not smart enough to be representative for the atheist community. Everybody ought to be honest with their own skill set. And so long as you are representing your own views and the means by which you acquire them, uh, smarts is not the issue, it's method. And absolutely everybody can play the same game. Um, everybody who thinks I'm that super duper smart should know I've just been at it a long time. And I've been able to accumulate a large data set, and I'm not bad at remembering stuff in, in a memory palace, in effect, which is what I've been creating over the years. So um, everybody can do it. I'm actually slow at reading, and I have to kind of proceed very carefully with stuff, and it's only sometimes after I've collected a mass of information, which is why I like to read hard copy and not on the computer, because it's much harder to do this um, without hard copy is I'll suddenly go light bulb and realize that there's some idiotic mistake that somebody had made that I had missed the second or third times around because I just wasn't close enough to see what was going on. So it's just a matter of diligence. Uh, I am nothing if not tenacious, not successful, but I am tenacious. Anyway, I was wondering, uh, um, yeah, retention is half of the game, uh, Fino. Quite right. I, I realized after the fact creating one of these memory palace modes where when you connect up information in a way that's meaningful it's way easier to remember it even as it is sometimes I'll, I'll forget what a particular technical paper or something was because I, I don't remember the titles of everything but I can remember the subject matter or maybe the author or something like that and ferret my way through it, it once I get something processed like I've done on the old tip work uh, and or uh, evolution slam dunk then here in my brain and I can pull stuff out of the hat much much better with material that I've already written down and I think there's a, a actual cognitive literature um, that um, reinforces the idea that you are in effect creating an external memory source that your brain can access more easily by the act of writing it down or Oh, gonna go for it. Wait until he starts using a cam, he says. Uh, James won't be the worst to look at by a long shot. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we, we old farts uh, have to stick together on that. Anyway, uh, I had thought about the prospect uh, dealing with um, bird evolution since it had come up uh, in various modes and I decided whether or not I was gonna run the risk of doing a, a show and tell. I still haven't graduated to the fancy schmancy thing where I could have like a PowerPoint slide system that I could put up on screen and all that. I, I, eventually I'll figure out how to do that. I'm, I'm slow on the uptake on this stuff. But although the reptile mammal transition is the really neat one uh, to deal with, uh, because it's, it's such a huge extensive fossil record and it involves us, um, birds have undergone a really big revolution in just the last 20 years or so. So if you were coming at this from the 1990s, they were, there was a relatively sparse fossil record for birds, and they didn't have what we now have. I will show a little show and tell here, because I collect these wonderful detailed dinosaur models. Wait a minute, i got to figure out. There we go. This is Codipteryx, uh, one of these nice little feathered theropods that um, has relatively normal sized uh, theropod arms, but it's covered with plumage and uh, tail plumage. And so the uh, a viewpoint today is that um, there's a good chance that feathers were de being developed in dinosaurs as much for sexual display, possibly as an offshoot of very rudimentary um, insulation for chicks that may have had like a little feathery down and that they disappeared this would there's another interesting bit to know what kind of paleo climate was involved in some of these northern latitudes D were birds developing uh, in tropical zones or whatever the planet was relatively warm but it did get cold farther north and also the altitude people uh, the animals were living in and we don't have a lot of information on that oh uh, um, Jackson weed is are you familiar with uh, Zhao Tingia? 
uh, is that a taxon name, uh, Jackson, or um, uh, otherwise? A, 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 you got a camera, damn it! Why don't you come into the to the meeting? Um, I think I put the, the blurb up on there. Let me do it again for the Hangouts. It's probably easier to chit chat on this. And believe it or not, I am okay with somebody other than me talking. So um, if you want to just jump in here, we can kind of bang, bang and forth on that. There was a, a piece where I was researching another um, taxon that happened to have a neat little Wikipedia map uh, that showed um, the um, island archipelagos that were existing in what would eventually become Europe. We know it, that's figuring somewhat because that's where Archaeopteryxes are found. And of course, China is way off in the corner. Uh, not an island, although it's apparently an isolated subcontinent during a lot of that period. But even there, it's complex. And, uh, ooh, Corn Lips has just announced, I just finished the new Paulo Geo video with Aaron. It was so excellent. Yeah, I got to uh, um, keep track of more of this stuff. I've only got so many hours in the day. And uh, I'm for somebody who's on video, what idiotic hypocrisy it is to um, be somewhat poo-pooing on video because I don't like the information content level of it. But at the same time, it allows me to kind of interact with people and um, uh, talk about stuff in a conversational way that has a higher data range than you could do in tweets. So they both have their upsides. They both have their downside. Yeah, Jackson, you can mute him. <laughs> uh, um, Jackson has done some wonderful interviews. He's got a thing um, coming up with some uh, other uh, folk, and uh, we're going to have some nice uh, discussions on that. He's still up in the air, so I won't be stealing his thunder on it. Um, but um, he's, he's a bright, literate guy. He knows a lot of material. I was actually taking notes during his uh, chat with uh, PZ Myers. Anyway, um, Caudipteryx that I showed you, the thing that's helped jumpstart bird evolution was our little pals, uh, the Deinonychids. Everybody that's seen Jurassic Park has seen these little beasties, except they call them Velociraptors. And they're, oh, hello, hello. And hello. you're very, very dim, Jackson. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay, now I'm getting sound. Hi, Jackson. So, uh, 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 Gentilia, is that a, a reference to a taxon or to a geographical thing? Because I, I, you may have got to stump the RJ on that one. Fill us in. Oh, uh, Shaotinja, oh, I believe that's how it's pronounced. Uh, displaced uh, Archaeopteryx, I think, is. Oh, bird. yeah, now I remember this one. Yeah, that was that 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 was just slightly earlier, um, in, in China. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, yeah. I do remember that. I got. I, I the paper probably doesn't refer to that in the taxon title. So if I were to do a a, a text search on there, I probably wouldn't come up with it. Um, and there's still, it's somewhat controversial because of the fact of the dating range for that particular era, because most of it is, is um, Cretaceous, but bits of it piece back into the Jurassic. Um, uh, it, it looks like the Jurassic date can hold for it. And to find a Chinese taxon similar to, but yet distinct from Archaeopteryx, yeah, that, that's really it. Uh, tell, tell us what you know about that. Fill us in from your end. Uh, it's... Uh, I came across it uh, recently. I was looking up uh, early uh, early transitions between non-avian dinosaurs and birds, and it says the most uh, or kind of sister to all the rest of them is is Archaeopteryx, and then it's Shautingia, then it's uh, Aurornis, I think, or Anchiornis, one of those, and then you kind of get into the the uh, the Eornithes, I think, if I remember correctly, because Enantiornithines oh, and Enantiornithines, boy, that's a tongue twister. I'm constantly tripping up over it's. It's the opposite birds that are the dominant ones of the Cretaceous, and yeah. uh, from what I remember, it looks a darn lot similar to Archaeopteryx, and it really is one where that it's more the paleontologist systematic systematics where there's some particular bone structures and that that are distinctive enough that put it as a more basal type than Archaeopteryx. But if either one of them were to land on your desk uh, right off the bat, you would have a devil of a time telling them apart. Uh, that uh, I think it's uh, the, the inner detail stuff. Um, the, 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 that's the vexing part 
is the fact that there's so little data available in that period of about 150, 140 million years, 160 million years ago. So we don't know how many bird or proto bird species there are. I think I mentioned either in a, an after chat or in one of the previous uh, evolution hours that one of the circumstantial things about feathers is that they're not showing up much as stray feather impressions until the Cretaceous. So it, this implies also the role of feathered theropods, that um, feathers are probably not proliferating spectacularly in theropods until you get into the Cretaceous. That's when you have them going around enough that something can just fall off and go flip, 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 flop down and land in some little uh, um, deposit somewhere or get trapped in amber. Uh, we also actually have a Cretaceous uh, feather in amber that's a proto feather that's got the little almost barbules that were predicted on evolutionary grounds by Prum and Brush and that have therefore been fulfilled. So uh, that's, uh, and that would be in the Cretaceous. So obviously there were still feathered theropods that still possess these non-aerodynamic, non-plumaceous proto feathers. And what exactly was going on in the metabolism and structure of things? Hello, we have another person show up. Hi, introduce yourself. Oh, Harry Holler here. Yeah, Hi, you, you, got a, you, you got a new avatar logo. I didn't recognize you at first. Um, I think I've been using the same one. Oh, well, I've, I've, I've got always the same mug in my stupid picture, and I figure that's oh, going to be my damn logo. Oh, no I what. see what it is. I'm on the other heavy hauler account. That's what happened. Oh, you're, yes. you're trying to fool me now. Well, that's still one of the things. My avatar, that one is like from Second Life. But anyway. Yeah, well, anyway, well, I, am, I am having enough trouble getting used to one avatar, let alone a flock of them. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically going, there's going to be just one of me, and that's it. You've got to live with it. Anyway, the neat things uh, that came along, one uh, of the reasons why lecture on, on birds, because it's so fascinating, is that one of I the things that got our little... Hmm? I made a taxonomic mistake. Uh, Auron uh, it's Auronus branches oh. off first, then Eosynopteryx, then Anchiornis, then Archaeopteryx, then Shautengia, then Rayonavis, and then uh, it goes uh, from there. Oh, uh, Euornis uh, don't come along until uh, much later taxonomically. So, okay, I made a mistake there. Yeah, well, the, the interesting, of course, a lot of that is cladistic, not fossil that they're looking yes. at it purely systematically as to what's branching off from what and uh, uh, all of those things have to have to them because you don't have the fossil data and exactly when the timings are taking place the cladistic analysis is probably going to hold up no matter what but the timings and location and the biogeography of it you basically throw yourself up in the air because you just don't have the basal data to know what was living where and what was related to what over what period and what are the dynamics and, and uh, that. Anyway, our little pals, yeah. uh, the Dynonicids, um, I hope sorry, I turn around to see, yeah, is this, is, is this the most pathetic thing you could possibly imagine? Let's see if it does a, a, a focus in. It's still blurry. I guess kind of the same thing happened to uh, the... The uh, Eutherian yeah, superorders, uh, Xenarthra uh, and Afrotheria. Yeah, that's why anybody, uh, anybody who uses taxonomical material from like 2004, time ago, that, that you just better always watch out about any of that stuff. In fact, there's a whole bunch of benchmarks in um, uh, the, the dates of things that you need to watch out for when you're dealing with material. So any work that's like from, um, ooh, freaky audio, I agree, BJ Price, I'm, uh, we're, we're trying to do the best we can on stuff. Um, anybody doing stuff on deeper core macroevolution issues. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was just wondering whether we were getting some, some feedback or-, or, or All right, uh, that, was, that was me, my mistake. <laughs> anyway, um, anything before the discovery of DNA, all they were doing were genetic data that were based on a kind of higher level analysis that we would really be leery of today because they didn't know the actual mechanism of what was going on in the nuts and bolts end. And then mm -hmm. another benchmark date would be the mid-1990s when homeobox genes were discovered. 
So anybody thinking to do deep analysis of developmental uh, biology was playing with only a partial deck until they found out about all these uh, homeotic genes. So, uh, so in the case of, of uh, uh, bird evolution, once you started finding feathered theropods and also the more blips that came on the scope later in the Cretaceous, uh, you get better sense of how much we don't know. A busy world of things changing and of which one of the most delicious examples that just popped up in a few years, if you're familiar with the Archaeoraptor hoax, uh, that uh, yeah. creation is to this day, the Piltdown Bird, Jonathan Wells and all this, they were just going ballistic over it. Uh, it turns out, part of this faked up fossil, turns out to be a Microraptor, which is just a cute little critter. Come on. Hey, what brand is that? You. Uh, oh, gosh, I think they're from the uh, Carnegie. Uh, line up uh, the uh, um, oh yipes let me see my uh, if I yeah, can see here I, yeah the Carnegie Micro Raptor this one the Safari Limited I think it is um, this uh, one is not in the I, problem or, was for years all I like the to order the what they had an Archaeopteryx too but it, it sold out in a hurry and I don't know if it's still available and some of these things they do limited runs on so if if you don't grab them uh, I bought some of these quite a few years ago, and I still had a better cash flow than I have now. Uh, but I've got a whole, I've got packs and herds of dinosaurs out in the garage. Carnegie was really pretty awesome. Safari Limited, not too bad either. Yeah. Uh, there were actually quite a few. Uh, one of the things that actually jump started my my love of dinosaurs again was that uh, when the British Museum came out with their uh, dinosaur uh, models around 1980. Uh, so I was like the the kid. I worked at a department store that's since closed downtown, and they had like a toy shop. And I happened to be going through to somewhere else, and I go, Brontosaurus on scale with Tyrannosaur, yay! And boy, I had to pick up those in a hurry, because literally those were the first time anybody had put all of the taxa on the same scale. If the old ones that were based on the Yale uh, ones, that you still find them in dinosaur kits, uh, and they were not bad stuff, but they would have the tail dragging Tyrannosaurus and, of course, your Brontosaurus with that great big Camarasaurus head and all that. But they were all not on the right scale. Even as a kid, because I collected these back in the 60s, my little kid brain, there's this Diplodocus in, my in the World Book Encyclopedia. It's like the longest dinosaur. But is it bigger mass and longer, or is it the same mass but just happens to have really long neck? I couldn't tell from the drawings, and you didn't have a sense of that. Well, with the British Museum, I have my Diplodocus, and I have my uh, Apatosaurus, and they're all on the same scale. And now I know, no, the Apatosaurus is actually a heavier-bodied animal, but with relatively short neck and, and head. Um, and... Uh, that, then the um, uh, Boston Museum did a, a series of ones, including that fabulous rearing uh, Apatosaurus that uh, everybody regards as somewhat controversial. And uh, uh, that we could. Uh, was it a Diplodocus, though? I've got one. It's a Diplodocus think... rearing up on his hind legs. He's yeah, brown. yeah. It's the one they had. And, and, and it's about it's... a foot tall. There's a legitimate argument to be made that, s that the Diplodocids that have extremely high vertebral spines over their. Uh, uh, back uh, legs uh, may have been able to do some kind of rearing, not only for display, but maybe even in relation to how they did sex. Any uh, paleoanthropologist would love that because what's interesting show up on a lot of different animals. If you look at a, at a, a Brachiosaurus, uh, the skeleton of that, it has a, in effect a pre elongated upper angled neck. And there's some debate about how high up it could go. But basically, it was a relatively high browser without having to do anything beyond that. Uh, but it, it has none of that super tall vertebral spine. And what it basically does in the case of the diplodocids is produce like a suspension bridge effect between the extremely long tail and the extremely long neck. And uh, an argument can be made that that can give it enough leverage in principle that it could rear up on the hind legs. And I'm a romantic that's the case. If you look at something that has the longest neck of all, the Mamenchosaurus, uh, and th those ones are just spectacularly long. <laughs> the giraffe legs. dinosaurs. They do not have vertebral uh, things over the uh, hind legs. 
and you wonder why. If you need that high vertebral spines in order to act as a suspension bridge, how the hell was Mimankasaurus doing it with an even longer neck? And that must mean, no, it's something different than that. And, and so I'm, I'm rooting for the idea that at least that branch of the diplodocids uh, was able to do a measure of rearing. And there's been some argument that it was a defensive posture that it could do. I mean, can you imagine if you're an Allosaurus, even if they're in a pack, bearing down on some apatosaurus that rears up on its hind legs. And remember, they've got quite substantial uh, claws. That thing is like this, whoa! And have there's you, no reason to imagine that these other animals would behave differently than what we find where threat displays make you feel puffer fishes, all that kind of stuff. It's it's common in nature. So the romantic in me is going for a rearing diplodocate. Yeah, I, I, you, in, until you, some you, dynamic right. things where they actually work out the muscle structure and stuff and say, Nick's. I'm I'm going with it. Have Jumping you seen the uh, the the, uh, the Omisaurus uh, drawings? Uh, they're like uh, all like, uh, with the super uh, long, the super long uh, giraffe-like neck. Mm. Oh yeah, that, that that's the one area where I think they have made a very good case that the Plodicids and and the sauropods in general did not much. And so they had to basically be angled to that because there is issues about how you can pump blood up that high. And mm -hmm. I think even there's been more paleo analysis of the kinds of plants they were eating and the browsing things that essentially, the, the youngsters of course can browse at lower levels and the bigger ones can go up higher. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that the sauropods of that type still survived in the island subcontinent of South America. Uh, where the titanosaurs and all that uh, maintain quite a large group of, of uh, a large uh, sauropods and that, but nowhere else. And then, of course, the brachiosaurs still survived an awful lot over in Africa, but they had that already pre-angled. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we're always learning stuff about these little critters all the time. It's absolutely you, delightful. Anyway. You've heard of uh, Hateg Island or Hateg Island? Is in like Yeah, the one with the little... Yeah, it had all the little. Yeah, so looking into something on that, the little dwarf, the, the little dwarf dinosaurs and stuff that survived up there. Yeah, I think that's really uh, yeah, some neat stuff because they had a there was a. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say there was a. I can't I can't remember the name of the titanosaur off the top of my head that was up there and that was dwarf. Mm. I remember yeah, were... and even even if you look, there's one in South America, uh, the, um, Amerigosaurus. It's got a bunch of weird little spines on it. Uh, it's uh, a cousin to the Titanosaurus. Um, so a lot of smaller model arpods are running around, and you wonder uh, uh, um, what kind of bio uh, connections they're doing because they're in the Cretaceous. So now they're now in a world of flowering plants, and there's the issue about uh, I I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I know hadrosaurs got around a hell of a lot, but the, the um, uh, ceratopsids, of course, are exclusively North American. So the kinds of browsing things that they would be doing on low vegetation in those tough uh, new uh, angiosperms that are coming down the line uh, wouldn't apply down in South America. So bit by bit, I imagine would they be working through pollen structures and working out phylogenetic relationships of how far back certain plant lineages work and all that. So it's, like, it's a fascinating ongoing puzzle. And uh, the more I see on it, the more uh, the merrier. Uh, it, it, that that w if you were to jump back to where uh, our graybeard and I were young, our world of dinosaurs is radically different conceptually than yeah uh, than uh, you your generation, Jackson, where you are now in a world where you've always known dinosaurs as very active creatures that have connections to birds and all of that, that it's for all practical purposes, that's part of your kit bag. But that was really a, a tremendous revolution. Uh, from the 80s and 90s on, it started out with, uh, in fact, you you kind of resembled uh, um, uh, uh, Robert Backer. Uh, yeah. He's got a scraggly beard. Uh, the, um, uh, the wild man of paleontology. Uh, he's, he's, um, has a mixed reputation in the paleontology field, but he's always <laughs> interesting. Yeah, as long as we don't talk about a phytodinosauria. Remember? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and he's still in a, in, a, in a mess over, you know, his various views on uh, on the little uh, nanotyrannus and the like that I think 
the view currently is that it's just a juvenile form of a tyrannosaur rather than a separate oh, yeah. taxa. I, uh, yeah, because uh, they I were... Yeah, because like the, the pachycephalosaurs, they went through different uh, ontogenic, uh, ontogenic uh, stages where they look uh, different from, from the, the adults. And so like we classified like a... Was it um, uh, Stegosaurus? What? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I had to check that. It turned out that paper was in my bibliography. It took me a while to hunt around for it. I think Horner that. I know Prentice was uh, one of them. Oh, Dra uh, it was... Um, Dracorex wasn't Dracorex yeah, and Prentice were were like young pachycephalosaurus. They're basically ontogenic stages. Uh, yeah. There was a, a kind of little mini video, dinosaurs and yachtney, and it reminded me of this issue because it applied to sauropods and a lot of other things. Uh, and of course, there's still the debate. You know, Horner, I think, uh, uh, or maybe maybe it isn't Horner. The one that is arguing that the uh, ceratopsids, um, uh, the the triceratops ones, the triceratops is actually the juvenile of Torosaurus and all that. Well, that's, and been that's still already. kind of. An up in the air. I th I think that one's been debunked already because we found old yeah, and yeah, young Torosauruses and old and young pa uh, triceratops. Yeah. And so the, the, this reminds us, of course, creationists will pounce on that, say, see, there's confusion in the systematic community on that. And it, but it's because how do you tell what was related to what when you're looking at just an isolated snapshot? And the other exactly. factor is the, is the preservation aspect. Uh, Triceratops is almost known only from its skulls. And uh, I, I must say that I did like the idea of being... If it had been a juvenile form, there would have been a certain elegance to it because it would suggest that that's the one, they're the babies that are getting picked off by predators. And what we're getting is a sampling error of that. So there, there, I, I have a certain soft spot for it even so. So you get in, uh, God, I can't think of the guy's name that was the paleontologist on that. It just escaped me. Um, uh, Fino did mention that the rearing tetrapod would have uh, quite a lot of oomph behind its forelegs when coming back down, wouldn't it? Yeah, and so that would also depend upon how its bone structure works, how its musculature would work. It's still uncertain as to how they did sex. If you want to get into the uh, the racy aspect of paleontology, that they have a devil of a time figuring out how those sauropods, big, big critters, and how did they manage to do it? Uh, well, how long did it take? How about the ankylosaurs having sex? Yeah, oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with all those side plates and all of that. In fact, there are a variety of stegosaurs. Uh, some of the Chinese stegosaurs have very uh, uh, lateral uh, uh, plates pointing out in there. So um, if you went into the time machine there, you know, the uh, bringing along the little, little video there with the waka, 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 background music there to, to see the exciting world of dinosaur sex. Obviously, they did it because they managed uh, for 150 million years. So they, uh, whatever may be the problem, uh, it's our imagination, not theirs. <laughs> they probably you know, they, reproduced they, asexually. <laughs> yeah, yes, they budded. Yes, they, they budded kind of like uh, Steve Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to back up to the birds for just a second. Um, I, I could Google this, but it wouldn't be as much fun as asking and letting other people know as well. All right, you know, the KT boundary got all these extinctions, right? And, you yep. know, like dinosaurs, all these animals and stuff down here, nothing up here. No survivors. All right, now the birds, are, they obviously, the dinosaur, the flying dinosaurs, whatever you want to call them, they survived. So below the KT boundary and above the KT boundary, were any of the same species or similar things found? That, oh, oh, gosh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I've never heard. Yeah, it's it's not just well, birds and, and either. Oh, sorry, go um, ahead. It, even there, you have a lot of turnover um, uh, it, and and critters that are suspected that were around that we just don't have a data stream on. But um, uh, the the various mammals that came to extinction, their, their ancestors were already there, and basically they're the ones that slipped through. Frogs went through surprisingly unaffected by a lot of it. Uh, uh, the crocodiles were somewhat limited. Reptile Corals groups and that managed to go very nicely. But I was mostly wondering. Uh, yeah, of course, this the birds. 
entirely different element because there they had already been going through a long-term decline, uh, probably stressed by the Deccan eruptions that were altering ocean chemistry. And so it, it, about 5, 10, 15, 20 million years, uh, of that was already stressing the ecosystem before that. But um, the, the intriguing thing is we don't yet know how all of the interconnections work to why the ones that fell apart fell apart. Why did small birds make it through, but every small dinosaur, and there were some that were bird-sized. And so it's a really interesting puzzle as to why that 100% uh, a cutoff point that you couldn't imagine one small little isolated taxa of small uh, chicken-sized dinosaur managing to squeak through some compsognathus kind of critter that they all managed to gum up. And th the suspicion is, right, was the critical factor that the ability of these animals to fly out of danger in a way that no other animal could take up. Then the other big question mark mystery from the, the genetic data uh, suggests that bats predated the KT extinction. Even though the earliest fossils are much later, that right. they're suspecting they must have originated uh, back uh, um, 70 million years ago or so. Bats? And we don't have diddly squat fossil data to support that yet. Yeah, uh, we can't even through yeah we can't even figure out yet uh it's like which was it which came first the larynx or the wings like they haven't <laughs> even figured that out yet as far as i've read but my question though is like here you have a species of bird or whatever in the cretaceous is is there any lineage that can be traced going from cretaceous to the next oh gosh i forgot what it was <laughs> <laughs> going, going uh, i think I, I think it most of the major groupings, um, the, the regular ornithines, if memory serves me, um, uh, had already originated by the late Cretaceous. They weren't the dominant birds because they were the ancestors. I think loons, I don't know, the, the, the mallards and all that bunch, I think they come quite a bit later. But um, the, the basal standard bird models are on there, and I'm just riffing off my memory here. Um, the fact is that they're holes during the Cretaceous because the dominant birds are these enantornithines, the ones with the, the, uh, the shoulder blade made the wrong, opposite direction. And uh, their origin we don't know too much about uh, because uh, we don't have any of the fossil record in that earlier period. We're, we're, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the paleontology and the geology, there's a huge problem that faces everybody in this area. If you look at a geology text, it'll say early, middle, and late Triassic, Jurassic, early and late Cretaceous. Uh, what happened to the middle Cretaceous? And that's because so erosion is winning out so much other with the middle Cretaceous. Don't even think about it. That there are relatively few deposits that fall within that range of about a hundred million years ago that they don't even bother with it. It's either a, a classified as an early Cretaceous or late Cretaceous. Ironically, the Paluxy River tracks uh, are middle Cretaceous, uh, but there's so many of the areas around the world where where we'd love to know what was going on around that one hundred million year old period, but we don't. But Carl Baugh got to the the tracks first. <laughs> Law got to the tracks first, and then, and of course he's been. Uh, uh, he, he doesn't discuss this anymore because it was only in some of his video uh, shtick that he was doing years ago. But I just rolled in in hysteria when I learned this was in the think I early nineteen nineties where he was going to perform in his little hyperbaric chamber, which he still has, by the way. He was going to make a Dimetrodon dinosaur. That's what he described it as. The Metrodon dinosaur. And I'm going, excuse me, Dimetrodons are synapsid reptiles, air quotes reptile, and are therefore on our side of the fence. If you could take some Gila monster and just uh, air pressure it into a Dimetrodon, holy moly, you have gone way behind kinds. <laughs> and so I think you can turn, uh, turn a human being into, into Lucy the Australopithecine faster than you could manage to pull that trick off. But of course, he didn't do any such thing. I think he did some stuff where he supposedly found some fruit flies that lived a little longer than he was expecting them to in this hyperbaric chamber. I mean, it was, and, and supposedly snake venom underwent some wonderful thing. So great to know that, that in the Edenic world, snake venom was more lethal. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think he's thought this one through.
and he still do does stuff. He pops up. Uh, guys on his level, do they ever <laughs> think through that kind of stuff? <laughs> do they have the. Uh, I'm not sure they. Well, well, the problem is they don't know where to start. They know what they, or I, I actually, I'm not even sure they know what they what what they think about. They know what other creationists say f- at on some level about these things. Like as long as you generally disagree with the concept of deep time and common ancestry, you're good. You don't need to worry about the specifics. You're hitting on a really good point, Jackson, because it's my contention in the TIP project that anti-evolutionists in general, not just young Earth creationists, do map of time. They don't conceptualize in their own head what the hell they think happened. They have a vague idea, and some of them get a little less vague by Kurt Wise trying to figure out the, the, the these... Well, but Kurt Wise, too. He's done stuff on these monstrous um, uh, floating vegetation mats that are the size of Connecticut, supposedly, that are carrying masses of ecosystems as a block that they can float around in the post-flood world and land like a big blomp. Does that happen? Uh, uh, yeah, that happens so often, you know. And uh, uh, and he, But he can't get too far with it. That There's always the coming attraction quality to young earth creationism apologetics. And I'll give them, they try to think this shit through. The problem is, is there's no there there. They're never going to be able to shuffle the pieces around to make them work. So they eventually reach some zone that's getting murky in the same way that Marsh encountered way back in the 1940s with baromenology. And then they'll start getting very quiet and the, you, you won't see them doing too much. Jump in. Yeah, if you've got this humongous mat that big and it's got animals on it, don't you think some humans could do that too? You know, be survived, <laughs> survived on these big mat, mats or rafts. Do you see anything? Nowadays? I think it works for Gilligan's Island. Yeah, well, yeah. Well. <laughs> but yeah, you've got, um, uh, there's a huge difference. For one thing, uh, uh, the, the dispersion, dispersalist uh, formats in normal biogeography has the advantage of time, upper ceiling level about critters. We have that relentless pattern of island biogeography, which is that oh, yeah, if you definitely. find an island out in the middle of nowhere, there's certain things you ain't going to find there unless they're brought there by people because there's no way to get there. And Hawaii is just a spectacular example. You know, it's got 400 species of fruit flies. It's got most of the planet's fruit flies are living in Hawaii. What did they, 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 they really enjoyed the place. They got a booking at, uh, at uh, hotels.com uh, and, and really enjoyed the place. I don't know. But yet, even though there are for pigs and other kinds of animals can survive there theoretically, there are none endemic there. Why? Because they just are too big to be able to accidentally disperse. Yeah, Darwin. So, and, oh, sorry. Sorry. I remember you have to uh, uh, tell me to shut up every once in a while. Oh, I was just sometimes I just vomit knowledge. Um, but uh, I remember <laughs> reading Origin of Species. Dar in Darwin's day, they noted that there were no amphibians on distant islands. About the only yeah. thing he had slight difficulty explaining, which he did eventually explain, was the wara. Uh, off the coast of mm -hmm. uh, southern South America, that was the only. And yeah. and now today we look at it and we see it's closely related to the South American Maine wolf. And there were uh, there used to be uh, rocks or like a land bridge that linked the islands to South America. But yeah, you're not gonna. Yeah, you're, you might find bats, but that's about it. You're not gonna you find. Mean, if, you, if you remember Lemuria. Lemuria? The lost continent of Lemuria. Oh, let me give you a let me give you a, a lore of imaginary continents and how All science right. kind of inadvertently mucked into it. Um, uh, Ignatius Donnelly, who was a um, I think a Republican congressman uh, in the 1880s, also got a bee in his bonnet that Atlantis of Plato was real. And uh, so he was collecting all sorts of, of stuff to do that. And he was a quirky little character, kind of a reformist guy and also a bit of an oddball. Anyway, uh, he did a bunch of stuff uh, on uh, Atlantis, the Lost Continent uh, lore. And a bunch of other ones wanted to pick up on that shtick. 
So they would just kind of invent their own continents. The next player in here was Madame Blavatsky, uh, one of the founders of the Theosophy movement. Uh, and uh, it happened to be that because of the lemurs of India and the lemurs of Madagascar and considered close relatives, we now know that there's a more complicated relationship in that, but they, they didn't think uh, so at the time, that there was the land bridge rush of the 1880s and 1890s. And so uh, some uh, paleogeographers postulated that there was a, 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 a huge land bridge connecting India and uh, Madagascar not realizing that, of course, uh, continents have moved and all that kind of stuff. But what did they know in the 1890s? Anyway, Blavatsky picked up on this science, air quotes, and uh, so she wrote about this big Lemurian supercontinent that he filled out the Indian Ocean and was actually even better than Atlantis. Atlantis was the low rent district that is did, that, that came after the great Lemurian super civilization. And um, then this guy named Churchwood in the 1930s decided to up the ante so he created the lost continent of Mu in the Pacific. <laughs> it was even bigger. And, uh, and Lemuria was just kind of the low rent district of what happened after Mu collapsed. Well, by this time, he was just making shit up, whereas poor Blavatsky at least was kind of riffing off of some science. And to some extent, poor Ignatius Donnelly was actually riffing off some of the 1880s science. But by the time you're in the 1930s, you know, it's in cloud cuckoo land. So anyway, um, uh, Lemuria is one of the three uh, mythical supercontinents of which um, none of them actually existed in reality and they, they connect up then if you start reading with supercontinent and advanced civilization lore that will connect up with uh, Robert Childress and some of the people that connect up with some of the flood geology people and so there's some interesting parties that go on over there in ancient astronaut land uh, that you can still see connecting so if you know the background of these things if they happen to mention anything in regarding Lemuria you could do face palm we're on that. I got to check over in here to see um, whether there's Paul any comments drive. about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It looks like just some back chat going back and forth on there. Yeah. Uh, oh. So, so there I, oh, jump in. Yeah. Um, do you know much about ERVs? A little bit. And, uh, oh, endogenous uh, retroviruses? Yeah. My, my, my question, and, I, and I've not really looked into it because reading creationist material gives me a headache. Uh, it can do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the forums on Facebook are bad enough. But, I mean, I'm just curious if y'all had any views on how do creationists explain ERVs? Because, like, we and chimps share certain specific ERVs, but we don't share them with gorillas and orangutans. And there are others that we share with those other ones. There was a study or a thing done where it had like us, horses, pigs, and chimpanzees. And on chromosome 17 of all four species was the same ERV spread out across all four different species. So, common ancestry, right? That's the only way it could happen. Uh, I'm looking it up right now yep. seeing what uh, answers in Genesis says. I had a link to it. It's on in, in the see, uh, I, I can't even try to put ERV. Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, okay, I've got just under ERV bit, single paper, uh, evolution dismantled. There's a thing from 2013 are endogenous retroviral sequences evidence for evolution. And of course, they always answer no. And then there's. Um, in common descent do shared ERVs support common ancestry. That's a Jonathan McClatchy post from 2011. And then we got a. Uh, okay. uh, it's and just the rest says, of, oh. Yeah, if, if I'm just riffing off of delved into at the at the full source methods approach, so I'm just kind of riffing off of my general impression. And yeah, my impression they're is they're that insertions they're saying, in the, into our in the you know the DNA made by viruses. And oh, I'm not, and yeah. okay. But I'm just trying to remember what the, the creationist and intelligent design positions are on it. I think they're, they're the same position. They're just saying they're, it's uh, a result of the fall. Um, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah because the, the, uh, at the, the level that I've seen, see uh, your Jeffrey Tompkins types and your uh, um, uh, um, in, um, Casey Luskin and a few others have zipped off onto this as well is that they're not denying that the DNA strings 
they could be retroviral in nature, but they're somehow functional and or intentional and or, uh, let's think about something else, shall we? Uh, that's the, the general impression that's, that I get into. God intended it to be. Yes, that's what it says yeah, on Georgia yeah. Purdom's article. Yeah, but I mean, when you look yeah, at I, them and the science behind them, they're, they're insertions made by old viruses. And the, the insertions, when they finally stop functioning and producing the, the, the virus or whatever, they should remain in the genome and were passed down generation after generation after generation after generation. Yeah. And my favorite one, of course, is, uh, and it's my, uh, uh, gotcha, uh, is ALU. Is, there are over a million copies of it in our human genome. So it's not something that's going on with, with wildebeests. It's us. And 10% of our genome is just ALU. And some of them have got inviggled into the brain, and we actually make use of them functionally and desirably. But they can also screw up, and they're connected to Alzheimer's and a few little malfunctions there. Uh, most of the time, they're just sitting there doing nothing because they don't have a README code. And so they, they have the copy me part, but not the README part. So they can just proliferate. And I think it's like every uh, 200 more of them are popping up in the human genome every generation because they're, they're, they can't stop the damn things. And uh, most of the time, they don't do a damn thing unless a mutation can occur which turns that first thing into a readme code. It's probably not a good thing because it's popped up all over the place and it's more likely if it's in a protein coding, it could screw up whatever protein is being folded and there are diseases that come about because of that. Uh, if it's in a cis regulatory thing, it's suddenly altering the regulation system of that. But once in a while, some of these accidental turn-ons will be functional and desirable. They'll actually be ver uh, useful. And so the idea that if this is me, uh, could you please deal with it? Uh, when you look at uh, Jonathan Wells' junk DNA book, the first thing I looked at was to see what he had to say about ALU. So he mentions it just once. And he just talks about just a tiny example of it. Well, excuse me, you have a apparently functional ALU. Thank you very much. You only got 1,450,000 to go. Uh, keep at it, Jonathan. You can manage it. Yeah. I actually had a bigger listing of functional ALUs in my backlog. I got a whole stack of material on it downstairs um, that um, was bigger than his thing. How come he couldn't find it? So, uh, uh, and it turns out I got a section for those of you who buy Evolution Slam Dunk. Uh, I've got a section in there uh, that goes into that and the cousin that's found in rodents that uh, has gone its own little separate way along their listing because the version we have is one that we inherited from the primates, whereas the version over in the, in the rodents has gone its own little bit. But they have a lot of the same components and they got that little copy me thing. Uh, um, uh, although Wells tried to tiptoe past the implications of all of this stuff, boy... Eh, he's not looking good the more you look at the material. Yeah, yeah that's um, that's the nuts and bolts end. And, it, and because these are retroviruses, relevant issue that's still hot fighting terms in, in regular evolutionary theory is how much of what we're seeing in retroviruses are a foam on the beer of, of DNA that gets accidentally turned into RNA and it takes on a life of its own and forms the new virus that might actually have been knocking around a long time that keep on bumping into us because of the foam on the beer series. And even more, are some of the viruses actually ones that are dim and distant reflections of what was going on in living systems before Luca, the last universal common ancestor. And it's still variable up in the air things. I'm rooting for the idea that at least some of the systems that are in use in uh, retrotransposition are clues about what was happening in living systems before it turned into the living systems that we now see as the ubiquitous life form. There's just a lot of people that are investigating in, into that area, and none of them are anti-evolutionists because they don't do that kind of work. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that would be just exhausting. <laughs> and, of course, you'd terribly run the risk of the uh, same reason why intelligent design people don't do paleontology much. I mean, I would just pay to go out with Steve Meyer into the middle of, of, of some hot 
annoying desert with Paul Serino and the, and the people and Jennifer Clack and all of that who actually do the paleontology and to see how long that little button down coffee drinking academic <laughs> would work under those circumstances. <laughs> oh dear. One, one thing that's kind of surprised me, well, like, from what I understand, the, the, the younger creationism thing started with St. Adventist Church. And what's her name? Ellen White. But there are actual scientists, you know, like from mm -hmm. Linda University that are actually out in the field doing work. With them, oh, yeah. Like the whales down in Peru. You know? Bingo, and I think bingo. you got to give them props. They're, oh, they're trying to be science. Yeah. And they, they love the like, science. They're, they're sure they're right. Yeah. There was they even. They're doing the work. There was an argument going on about. Some of them were going, okay, these were millions of years ago. They were not met, buried there during the flood. And then some of the other ones were going, no, they, they were buried during the flood. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was, I thought that was so cool because what, what, yeah, yeah, they, they, where I found out. But about, you got to give them props. They're putting yeah, their money definitely. where their mouth is and revealing yeah. that they're always young earth creation. That you never see the intelligent designers doing this. At least the creationists go out. The the, the little uh, there there are a whole bunch of them in the United States here, where uh, creationists will get together and they have their little team. They go out in the middle of nowhere and they're digging stuff up. Uh, the new uh, guy who was um, uh, the uh, uh, Montana's representative, the guy that punched out the reporter, um, uh, uh, underwrote uh, the um, uh, Canthosaurus. Um, uh, Acrocanthosaurus uh, fossil that he put in that little museum down there in uh, Montana uh, cost millions of dollars to do it. So th th there's a group, and of course the baromenologists. You know, they're they're trying to work out a creation of systematics. Can't. It's never going to fit. So the, when they're trying to look at the material, they can they can look at it at a tunnel vision level where they can describe the fossil bones and they can do some hope for that. But eventually they're going to start bumping into data stream that can't be fit into the box. And that's where they're falling by the wayside. So I, I'm intrigued to see, I'll be intrigued to see what all comes furthermore down the road as to whether or not anything really gets substantively published more about like say the, the, uh, the new whales down there, which I gather um, a variant forms of these bacillosaurids that are the one whale group that really swam all over the place. Uh, they're the state fossil of Kansas. Uh, because uh, there were a lot of estuaries and stuff around there, and and uh, from what I remember from the material, there was uh, all that had mainly survived were a lot of skulls, and so they weren't a lot of full bodies. So you need to know more about the whole anatomy to be able to tell a bit more about what was going on. I would be particularly interested in seeing how they were on vestigial hind legs, because we know the bacillosaurids in Egypt. Uh, had vestigial hind legs, and some of the other ones have been found since. Also, where their blowhole and stuff is, because they, uh, I believe, the best of the swords are so early that they've still got their nostril uh, the way their ancestors did. Which you'd wonder why the designer just keeps on doing this stuff that fits an evolutionary perspective, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll look at it. dolphin embryos. Uh, I saw a series of pictures of dolphin embryos. The nostrils start on the end of the snout, and as the embryo develops, they go right up to the forehead. Mm -hmm. Our embryos, human awesome. embryos, are born with tails that are reabsorbed, and the pharyngeal mm -hmm. pouches and stuff. You know, here's the stuff that's right there in front of your damn face, and then they try and go, "Oh well, this, that, and the other thing." You know. Yeah, there are even like the the vestigial genes that we have, like, uh, and and whales are a great example. We were talking about uh, the other day, RJ. The, yeah. the baleen whales have the genes for teeth, even though they don't make teeth. What the heck? Why? It's even worse than that. All toothless mammals have tooth enamel genes. Every single one of them. It's not them, just yeah. whales. Didn't they find yeah, And so it, all, all ones that, that have teeth but no tooth enamel still have tooth enamel genes because they, they haven't been able or far enough back that they can all be pseudogenized. Didn't they finally find one or part of one that had teeth and some baleen that was starting yes. to... Yes. Yeah, Chonocetus. Yeah, they got okay. a transitional form on a lot of that stuff. And there again, I, I call it the fossil genie in Slam Dunk, that uh, th there's this fossil genie out there that just seems dedicated to putting things down to make evolutionists happy. He just loves it so much. 
And if for those those creationists, this don't seem to get benefits from this. You know, one damn crocodile really would be helpful to their case, but nope, we don't get any of those. Well, see, I think I mentioned before in a hangout with you that there's no telling what we're going to find next that will just kind of turn things around and go, oh my goodness. Okay, we need to rethink this, but it will still work. You know, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't top away evolution. It just adds another layer to it of like, wow. Well, and it won't we appear. Found. It won't appear without context, because yes. you know, this is why uh, another area where an awful lot of anti-evolutionists screw up is on the convergence issue. That that how is it that similar looking things or similar functioning molecules can come about by different processes in different lineages? But when you look at the whole package, you start seeing why it. It can turn out that way if you've got uh, the marsupial wolf versus the mammal wolf. Yeah, there's a lot of superficial resemblances, but the moment you start looking at how many molars they've got and other features of their skull, the marsupial wolf is a marsupial, not a placental. There's no way that you could confuse the two. And yet, if you look at them, well, they're all kind of wolf-like, yeah, and we're all basically primate-like too. But how many of those little creationists are willing to use that analogy when it comes to our species? Well, it's kind of like certain basic forms can be selected <laughs> for in different lineages, you know, in different places in the world. The, the uh, fish with the antifreeze for blood, as they call it, there are two yeah. different species, and they're way far apart, but they, don't, they didn't have the same mechanism to, to get to the, the, the clear blood that acts like antifreeze. It's two different processes. And like yeah. the uh, people in the Andes, the African highlands, and uh, no, oh gosh, uh, the Himalayas or whatever. Oh, yeah, a lot of those uh, uh, milk um, lactase uh, tolerance uh, pops up several different uh, 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 haplotypes. But and it's no coincidence that w that's the groups that have milk cows. Thank you very much. But the people up in these high altitude mountains, their environments, they can handle the thin air and everything. You know, their lungs are bigger, their heart and their blood, and this and that, and other things. You know, they can, they can handle the high altitude where it make us pass out. But each one is different. It's a different adaptation. They got to the same place by different means. So that was kind of like... And you can see the, you have certain how, the, how the anti-evolutionists will react to that. Stars and dolphins and because I say, well, there's still people. Uh, and the same, the same really applies to uh, moles. There are like three different types, or three different... Uh, mole like animals you've got the regular the regular moles which are um they're uh, Eulipotyphla, yeah and then you've got golden moles which are afrotherians and then marsupial moles and yeah. so this yeah the ones are on madagascar i i think it'd be interesting if we could find a a dinosaur mole i hope we find one of those I, the <laughs> well, closest well, we've found is kind of an interesting uh, little little issue about that would be uh, why certain echomorphs I think that's the term that people use in that, the echomorph. Uh, why certain ones of them pop up in certain contexts? Uh, my favorite example from the mammals that is telling us something kind of important by its very rarity is there's a little itty bitty critter uh, that's found in the mesal deposit, the same one where some of the early bats are found about 55 million years ago. It's one of those Lagerstätten deposits. Anyway, it's basically a teeter-totter format theropod style mammal. It's got a long balancing tail. That's really unusual for mammals, and apparently it doesn't work very well. Uh, whatever it is about it, it didn't seem to make it terribly successful. So there's a whole bunch of things. Bipedality in general is not something that seems to be a nice thing for mammals to do. We're an anomalous one in that respect. Kangaroos are another one, and you practically, and kangaroo rats, I think you've just exhausted the list of bipedal mammals. Uh, whereas bipedality was occurring all the time amongst um, uh, dinosaurs. Sometimes they were uh, um, um, bipedal in the sense that they would be four-legged, but they could rear on their hind legs. The hadrosaurs in that were like that, where they could just uh, balance on the hind legs and run around use their front limbs uh, effectively. Uh, and that stuff occurs over and over and over against amongst them. So there are probably channelizations that are taking place very, very deep in the dinosaur split that give it a, a leg up in terms of different adaptive things, and this is that issue of evolvability that you're occurring in the dinosaur lineage that eventually leads to birds, the ultimate bipeds, 
uh, that aren't occurring over on the mammal side of the fair, where, where the flying mammals are quadrupedal and show it the moment they land on the ground. So these things are actually giving you some sense of about the, the channelization that's taking place. Uh-oh, we've just gone over our, our hour here. And so I'll uh, be uh, pulling up this on, and then we want to figure out what we want to do for after show. Uh, uh, jump in there, uh, uh, Psy Strike. Uh, what the hell am I supposed to do? I stopped the broadcast, but can I continue to use this feed and restart it as the live thing, or do I have to start up a completely different gizmo? Are you out there, Psy? Psy, help me, old man in trouble. Do 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 Yeah, because I, I, I haven't listen I haven't done this before where I would have been using this as the live feed and then stop it and then theoretically restart it. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna be doing. I might have to actually start up an entirely new window and restart something else. So I'm going to hit the stop broadcast. I will be letting people know if I have to start up a new thing and a different hangout. I'll give everybody in the uh, live chat a link to use to that. And I hope you, uh, um, you two kids can show up as well if you have the time. So I am now stopping and we'll be restarting shortly.